Welcome from the British Institute of International Comparative Law. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, you are one of the 300 people attending BICOL's second webinar in our series on artificial intelligence and the future of regulation. Um, in the first uh, webinar, we had focus on artificial intelligence and data governance um, during the COVID-19 crisis. We had Lord Clement Jones leading a conversation with experts in the, in the field. This second webinar instead um, focuses on the business and human rights approach. Uh, we have an impressive lineup of speakers, so I will not take much more time and open the discussion with them. Um, only very quickly, and I'm sure you are by now even too familiar with Zoom webinars, but uh, just a reminder that people in the audience are not visible or, or audible. Um, we are taking questions from the audience, so please type your question in the Q&A box. You can also interact with questions that others are asking and um, upload them. Um, during the last hour, our speaker will answer your, uh, your question directly. Um, the webinar will be recorded and is going to be uploaded on the uh, uh, BICOL website uh, shortly after the, the end. Um, so over to our first speaker. Um, honor to have Professor Lorna McGregor, uh, Professor of International Human Rights Law at Essex University Law School. Uh, she's also the director of the Human Rights uh, Big Data and Technology Project, uh, which, by the way, I just set up, uh, um, set out the requirement for uh, the deployment of U UK contact tracing app uh, in a submission to the UK Parliament Joint Committee on Human Rights. Mm, yes, over to, to you, Lorna. Thank you so much, and thanks so much for the invitation to participate in this seminar today. Um, as I'm the first speaker, um, I will keep my points quite macro on the themes, but perhaps we can get into some more detail when um, we're in the discussion. But as a first point, um, which I think will be fleshed out more in the discussion with particular examples, um, I would just like to highlight that human rights are very clearly impacted by the use of data analytics and new and emerging technologies by both states and businesses. Now, privacy, freedom of expression, and discrimination are typically the trio of rights cited, but depending on the type of technology, the context in which it's being used, and on whom it's being used, all rights, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural, are potentially affected. So we're very much in the territory of human rights when we're talking about data-driven businesses. So to pick up on the two big questions of today's seminars, if human rights are affected, first, does the existing human rights legal framework provide adequate protection for human rights in a data-driven business environment, or do states need to um, regulate further? And second, um, are the UN guiding principles on business and human rights relevant? And before looking at the human rights legal framework specifically, I think as a baseline point, it is important to note that while I think the human rights legal framework is a critical part of what is needed to protect human rights in a data-driven business economy, human rights also rely on other frameworks to be in place. And two of the most obvious ones are effective data protection policies and competition laws, which might be picked up by other speakers. So, but when we actually look at the human rights framework as it stands, is it adequate to deal with the human rights impact of data-driven um, economies? So the first point um, is that a lot of the shark end examples for human rights that are being discussed at the moment. So think of facial recognition technologies, predictive analytics and welfare systems, the contact tracing apps that we're all looking at at the moment. They are where states and businesses are in a relationship in the public sector. And these may be areas where regulation may be helpful to reaffirm and make explicit the existing state obligations and existing business responsibilities to ensure that human rights are protected in, their de in states' dealings with tech companies. But that's not to say that the international human rights legal framework is inadequate, but that it needs to be enforced so there's much greater transparency around these relationships. And so that the involvement of the private sector is not only purpose limited, 
but that we ensure that states are carrying out due diligence um, processes on private sector actors so that they can catch problematic human rights track records of particular companies. So I think that's the first part about enforcing what we already have. The second point is that while the UNGPs reiterate state obligations under international human rights law, in relation to the obligation to protect, um, they, they reiterate that in relation to the obligation to protect against third party harm, the UNGPs are often criticized for their voluntary nature in relation to businesses. And this is again an area where we might want to think about more regulation. Because if we actually look at the content of the UNGPs, in my view, it's, it's strong. And if, it, if the UNGPs were actually implemented by businesses, it would make a huge difference to human rights. So just looking at principle 17, the due diligence provision, it's really important in talking about businesses having to identify, prevent, mitigate and account for how they address adverse human rights impacts. With many guides on what it looks like to do this, but if you really think about what due diligence means in its ideal form, it would mean that you have businesses, big tech companies, at the top level having buy-in by the top leadership. Um, setting out this commitment in clear and transparent policies to human rights, operationalizing that commitment throughout the company so there's really effective processes in place to identify and address any adverse human rights impact. So it's really built into the knowledge and culture of the business. And that would include through processes like human rights impact assessments, oversight processes, grievance mechanisms. Um, all carried out in meaningful consultation with stakeholder groups and it would really work in a feedback loop so that you see the operationalization of these policies feeding back into leadership. Now that would look really strong if we saw that all carried out and it could really be transformative to human rights protection, particularly in the tech sector where the relationship um, particularly in the tech sector where we think about data analytics and new and emerging technologies. And sometimes that human rights harm is opaque, including to the people who are affected. So if we had a really strong due diligence process in place, it could work really effectively to surface harm. But the problem is that as in other sectors, we have very little transparency on the extent to which these due diligence responsibilities set out in the UNGPs are actually being realized. Um, so we see some parts, we can see some leaders and particular businesses talking about the human rights commitment, but that cyclical idea of having human rights embedded throughout a company um, and really ensuring that principle 17 works effectively um, we don't know much about how tech companies are doing that. So it's really hard to ev evaluate how far they are complying. And this is where I think the proposals for mandatory due diligence um, processes can come in and may be appropriate. In other sectors, and generally this is a really live topic for states to regulate, um, to require businesses to carry out mandatory due diligence um, processes and it's been proposed in the recent um, report by Bickle which our chair was involved in but it's not been discussed a lot in the tech sector and I'll, I'll end there but I think that this is really a key area where we might want to be thinking around regulation. Thank you very much Lorna and um, thank you also for mentioning uh, Bickle uh, study. We have um, we carried out a study for the European Commission on the uh, different um, mandatory due diligence regulation that are uh, being established or are uh, uh, happening across uh, Europe with the idea that then uh, uh, the EU is going to develop uh, um, EU level mandatory um, due diligence legislation, which at the moment uh, is a proposal that has been um, put for forward as a commitment from the, from the EU. Um, and this is, uh, uh, it's a great introduction because uh, um, all the issues that you have mentioned around uh, um, the relevance of the UNGP, the need of enforcement regulation, I'm sure they are going to be picked up by, by the other speaker. But I just wanted to ask you a quick follow-up question um, in relation to, to the public-private par partnership especially. Uh, what do you think states and companies uh, should do as due diligence when they are engaging uh, with each other?
in using uh, artificial intelligence uh, in the public sector. Thanks. So I've already mentioned about um, states, um, and I think there's a lot more that they can really be doing, including in the procurement process, to really carry out effective due diligence in relation to which actors they choose to engage with. Um, and looking at the full human rights record, as well as ensuring that the agreements are very strong, ensuring like, data minimization, really being clear on the purpose of the relationship, what happens to any data when it's transferred, and, and really strict limitations around that. Um, I think that would be a you know, clear just operationalization of human rights obligations, but one that we actually don't see a lot of information on. And I think one interesting um, thing that has happened in the tech sphere is a number of state actors often being interested in human rights impact assessments um, as brought up by the UNGPs and, and talking about how they might then start to do this. So there's been this sort of transfer of the idea of impact assessments to the state. But on the business side as well, I think you know, it, it's also really important for businesses to be thinking about their due diligence um, obligations when they're engaging with states, particularly if there is a risk that their technologies will be used in these sharp end examples that I've talked about, like facial recognition technologies in contact tracing apps. Um, and so businesses trying to influence states in terms of how their technology is used and ensuring that human rights are protected that way. So I think it's it's two directional and while I've talked about some possible um, regulatory options, I think we can't also forget that there are other levers to ensure that human rights are protected and for businesses I think employees and investors have been shown in the tech sphere to be critical levers to ensure that human rights are protected. So putting pressure on companies around their consideration of how they engage with states. Um, through employee action um, and also through investors. Um, so I think we have to think about the range of ways that human rights are operationalized in this space, but definitely due diligence and state business relationships is a two-way process. Um, and it's really important to think about it in that way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, um, this actually uh, links to, um, to our uh, next topic because uh, um, an example of this public partnership we have seen, you know, the Joint Committee on Human Rights um, found out that contact tracing app uh, um, must, not, must not be rolled out nationally unless uh, there are guarantees in respect to not only the efficacy of proportionality but also privacy protection, and those needs to be placed in primary legislation, and that, that uh, human rights impact assessment should be carried out, and that there should be an independent body to oversee the use. Um, the effect and the privacy protection. Um, so, because we have a, an expert here, um, Michael uh, Ville, it's a, it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Michael Ville. Uh, he's a lecturer in uh, G digital rights and regulation at the University College London. Um, and he's also one of the authors of the Pan European Framework for Decentralized Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing, DP3T tracing system. Um, over to you, Michael. Thanks. Um, and I think this follows really well from what Lorna was saying, and hopefully I can specify down a little bit while also reflecting and keeping on the broad themes. Um, because this isn't a, a seminar about contact tracing, it's a seminar about, about human rights um, and, and technology. So firstly, I want to think about AI for a second. Um, uh, we've seen a lot of narratives about AI, and I think a lot of them are quite misleading. A lot of them see AI, the risk from AI as, as it discovering something secret about people, it inferring something secret about people and weaponizing that secret thing. That's been a very common framing and I think it's one that's wholly implanted by business um, uh, and, and is one we should challenge quite a lot. This isn't about inferences, it never has been. What it has been about, and, and it's, it's nice to look at uh, Julie Cohen, who's a professor at Georgetown, her recent book, Between Truth and Power, um, in relation to this, it's about rendering populations legible, programmable. Um, it's about finding ways to optimize society and to benefit from those optimizations. Now, who benefits? That's always a question here. And this is what we've seen happening around contact tracing applications. Of course, public health uh, interventions in general are often about um, changing behaviors to benefit 
uh, some collective or some other group of people rather than the people whose behaviors are being changed directly. And contact tracing applications, which effectively um, most of the, the sensible ones really are using Bluetooth to try and work out your distance between yourself, other people, and using that sensor to alert you if you are later found out to have been in contact with somebody who, who um, has diagnosed positive. Those systems are really about uh, uh, optimizing populations in other ways, changing interventions and specifying public health interventions. So what we've seen when we think about this um, is a quite interesting set of dynamics. In the UK and in France, Norway, India, it's pretty much it for the ones that are set on there. Uh, these countries have chosen a centralized system and they've, they've done that when you dig below the surface it's often so they can retain control of optimization they can continue to uh, to pick and choose pull levers and say this part of society does this this part of society does that really try and render their population programmable from a central point and when uh, we got involved in this process in about February. We were concerned that of the abuse of these technologies, the potential for abuse around the world. And um, uh, we're skeptical about the usefulness of these technologies, certainly, uh, but wanted to be productive and say, we can develop, put on the table, a, a more sound alternative. So at least you have to have a debate in the presence of a technology which is arguably more proportionate, limited, and, and respectful of human rights. We developed a a system where uh, personal data in effect does not leave your mobile phone. Uh, there is, uh, it, it doesn't create a centralized database and it gracefully dismantles as people use it. And it was called DP3T. Uh, this caused some controversy in the UK and France who wanted to do things their own way, but it caused quite a lot of controversy. Um, or not among the countries like Switzerland, Italy rolled it out today, uh, the system based on our, our approach. Um, lots of countries uh, have, have chosen and developing um, a decentralized model. But it caused controversy when Apple and Google put their cards on the table. They need to put their cards on the table because as soon as governments decided to make an app, that is a public-private partnership because we have two major operating systems in the world. Uh, there is no choice but to work with Apple and Google if you want to make an app. That's the end of that. Um, uh, however, Bluetooth is a very invasive or potentially invasive technology, and Apple in particular had restricted the use of Bluetooth in the background on their apps. Um, and that was a real uh, restricting factor for contact tracing applications. So governments had to go to companies, and they, had to, they were doing it without force of law initially. They still haven't um, tried any legal uh, action against these companies, and said, please help us use Bluetooth in the background on our phones. And ultimately, Apple and Google uh, had, had took our research and, and they claim their system is based on our system um, and said, we will let you use Bluetooth in the background if you use a decentralized approach. Um, and they did that in code, actually. There's a, there's a specific part of code they would need to give for a centralized approach, which they didn't give. Um, so it was just a non-provision. Um, but either way, it's a political choice. And ostensibly, uh, the logic behind this is a few. They have to engineer something that works. They don't want to have reputational risk in this particular case. Um, but one uh, stated logic is about human rights uh, and choices. If you give the UK access to a centralized system or France access to a centralized system, even if you trust those legal regimes, does that mean you give access to Hungary? Does that mean you give access to Poland? Does that mean you know, there's lots of other countries with limited uh, respect for human rights right now and fun fundamental rights and uh, you know in, in Europe but also around the world and this was sold as a code intervention to say we will build human rights into the code to stop abuse and this caused controversy in, in France people talked about sovereignty and, and should they be allowed to make a centralized system uh, in the end as I say none of these countries actually legislated in any way or tried to legislate to change the operating system to allow what they wanted um, so that's something that we can we can talk about a little bit more. But what I want to end on, and it links to, to what Lorna was saying about holistic analysis, is the way in which this debate has been framed. We came into this debate uh, with particular aims to limit privacy and power, and also to keep Apple and Google held to account, as well as keep states to account um, when they're using this technology. But what we see Apple do in particular is conflate privacy with all other human rights. Um, and this is a problem in light of modern and new technology because uh, I, I, it's a topic of my research. 
is privacy enhancing technologies. You can do cryptographically, you can often have your cake and eat it. You can do data analysis without ever centralizing data. And that seems like a really nice approach, but it makes you realize that you can optimize populations and you can effectively have strong influence even at a micro individual level, like micro targeting, without ever having personal data in one place. Um, so if you focus on privacy and a narrow version of privacy as embodied by the concept of confidentiality, you lose the idea of power. And privacy does stop power being abused in some regards, but this particular version of privacy, we see technologically ways to still perpetuate power. So where does that leave us? Um, looking at Google going forwards, we see Google's um, approach with, with federated machine learning, which is a version of machine learning that's running on everyone's devices. Uh, they have a new system called Flock, and it's in there in currently being trialed in their privacy sandbox. This effectively says, hey, we don't want to see your data. Google's not, never be interested in data. We don't really care. We just want to run a micro-targeting, specifically individualized system for, uh, for to targeting ads, understanding you enough to, to, to target you particularly. But we don't need to know about you particularly. And they orchestrate a code-based system uh, where they achieve their micro-targeting aims, they can specify, discriminate, they can deliver job ads more to, to men than women, they can do all sorts of things, while plausibly being able to say, we cannot mathematically see your personal data. It's impossible. So you go down this direction, and that's where we need to think about what Lorna was saying, about holistic analysis of human rights. We need to think about um, other points of accountability and intervention to stop the framing being controlled by state actors, uh, private actors rather, um, but also to, to educate state actors that it's not about inferences and data and big data, it's about infrastructure and how this infrastructure can be used and misused. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Michael. This is um, incredible insight into the, um, the way this uh, uh, technology work and uh, um, this, this issue of uh, the uh, this narrow version of, of privacy actually is, um, uh, is fascinating. I'm sure that we can uh, uh, continue the, the conversation later. But I, I, I was just um, going to, to ask you a, a bit more uh, broad question about, um, so what, what do you think are the consequences of uh, uh, privacy preserving technology uh, for a broader issues of data, um, society, and, and, and power, as you, as you mentioned? Thanks. Um, I think... I think that, that firstly, we have to get rid of this myth that, that it's about data and a centralization of data. We have to get rid of that myth from both human rights and competition law, because companies are one step ahead. These big firms are one step ahead. They are already getting rid of their data because they realize they don't need it. They have built their infrastructures and they will build them technically so they do not require centralization of data. And anyone who tells you that data is power doesn't understand it. Infrastructure is power and data was the old infrastructure, and now there are ways to, to use information, so information is being processed in different parts, but, but uh, without that centralization of data. And I'd say this in a maybe a hypocritical way, you know, I developed a decentralized system, but there are great things about these technologies. Privacy-preserving technologies are fantastic things, uh, and we can use them correctly, but they are not get-out-of-jail-free cards. And in fact, they, they help us by focusing on the non-privacy harms of technology use by saying, hey, here's the residual stuff, and here's why it's not properly governed right now. We proposed um, with, my, with Lillian Edwards at Newcastle University and lots of other academics, many of you will know, and many of whom have, have deal with Bickle a lot, we proposed a coronavirus safeguards bill um, uh, that tried to deal with the non-privacy aspects of the technology. And indeed, we have some significant problems with the Joint Committee on Human Rights proposed legislation because it is too privacy focused. And we have to think about coercion, and other forms of power that come from contact tracing apps um, rather than just uh, what their bill looks like, which is really replicating a lot of data protection law. Um, and, and that's not, um, not what we should be focusing on here. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Actually, this, this um, um, links very well to, uh, to our next um, speaker, uh, Isabella. Uh, um, I think she's going to, to give us um, a broad view on uh, uh, the business and human rights um, implication that uh, um, artificial intelligence and the data-driven economy um, 
uh, is going to, to, to present us with. Um, so um, she's a researcher at the Institute for Business Ethics at the University of St. Gallen um, and the lead author of the, um, of the study uh, that just been published on uh, business and human rights in the, in the data economy. Um, over to you, Isabel. Thank you, Irene, and thank you also for the invitation to speak. Um, I think what's interesting about um, the perspective of my institute, perhaps, is that we are one of the few institutes that combine um, management scholarship with the business and human rights perspective. Um, and obviously, we try to teach and, and research about how companies can change their actual behavior also inside companies. Um, for the better and really, uh, really, really integrate business and human rights principles. Um, and I think um, when we're just circling about the um, also dimensions of power, infrastructure and data, um, our most recent research inside companies uh, about um, using emerging technologies for human resource management is quite insightful in, in the light of COVID. Because um, what we see now is that even there are already like sort of vast data analytics or machine learning or AI driven monitoring practices at the workplace. Now what comes on top of that is unfortunately not contact tracing, but really um, most of the time tracking practices. And, and there you can sort of see that um, we will encounter novel challenges that weren't there before because we have all the, the data and the infrastructure that was needed for workplace monitoring practices or let's say workplace surveillance um, but then on top in 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 times of crisis um, businesses sees the necessity to sort of protect their workers and for that purpose then puts a lot of additional measures in place that in combination can really create a toxic mix um, toxic mix not only for for privacy but in in in, in retaliation also for other for, for sort of all human rights potentially and at the same time, also studies have actually shown that um, the, um, the performance of workers, if you want to really stop, talk in business language, um, diminishes um, when, when they feel that they're object of surveillance. So, so just perhaps showing these kind of two sides of the coin from, from somebody that might sit in a human resource management department. And that's often um, maybe sort of um, overlooked how to educate those people in a way that they sort of understand the the technical side, but also the human rights implications in, in this whole organizational embeddedness. Um, to take a step back, um, I really want to echo what Lorna said previously. Of course, the UN guiding principles for business and human rights are really important in this space. They sort of form a consensus, obviously, about the business responsibility uh, to respect human rights. Um, at the same time, um, there's, there's a lack of guidance on, on how exactly that would look like in the tech sector. And that's why um, my colleagues and I have decided to, to write that study about what business and human rights uh, would look like in a, in a data-driven business environment. Um, the, the, at the moment, we tend to focus a lot on sort of the iceberg, sort of big tech. Um, but when um, I go to the other departments in our university, um, you can really see that across all industries you have um, data-driven business environments and, and it's, it's not only big tech that we have to tackle, but we have to find a language that also can speak to the businesses um, that are applying big tech in very really day-to-day um, -day situations without wanting to be super innovative, but also often in combination with a lack of awareness that these are actually human rights issues they're, they're, they're touching upon. Um, and um, yeah, so what we're flashing out in the study are sort of these unique uh, challenges and novelties, but also these kind of combinatory logic really to, to try to make business understand that if they're just putting um, some data analytics on top of everything else they're already doing without looking at sort of the organizational interlinkages that might happen, they, they um, might lose out on, on context, on sort of the social technical um, notion of, of, of just like when you're trying to operationalize human interaction, human behavior, in particular in human resource management, there's a lot of biases and errors that can occur. Um, and, and yeah, our, our study depicts some of these issues and, and we really stress that human rights due diligence 
um, needs to become more data savvy, more tech savvy, like really take also the infrastructure and the power elements into, into account as well. Um, test the data models against biases and errors, ensure that there's proper representation of all affected stakeholder groups, also with regard to collective rights, um, mitigate unintended consequences that might um, occur when, when uh, the technology is actually implemented. And there we're also pointing to some research projects that are going on in the more um, in, at MIT and so forth in order to guarantee that sort of the classical business and human rights discourse that often focuses a lot on um, issues happening in the supply chain, often in the global south and around sort of working conditions can also um, sort of uh, encompass that more uh, digital space if there is such a sort of thing as a bit digital space. Um, and again, our hope was um, kind of publishing that study for the uh, German National Human Rights Institution helps to ultimately feed um, the business and human rights discourse into a discourse that is very dominated by sort of data protection and privacy um, um, frames, which are also important, but we have to also um, ensure that um, businesses start to revisit their day-to-day -day management practices in a way that it's not only analyzed by the legal department who often takes care of data protection and privacy, but really also the people that I just mentioned who might actually sit in human resource management or so forth. Um, so maybe imp important to, to name also that um, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has, has pushed off this, this project on around BTEC, so sort of really embarking on this journey of, of um, defining a little bit more closely um, what uh, business and human rights can mean in, in sort of the tech sector and beyond. And, and I think that's an important space to watch also to see what sort of consensus can emerge because they, they want to en engage closely with businesses, but thankfully um, also, um, yeah, civil society, academia, governments. Um, and um, so how could that work? Um, we, we, we are often, again, circling around this workplace situation. And here you can see that, for example, we, we can take lessons learned from the GDPR on, on privacy impact assessments, but then sort of broaden them up with a, a, with a, with a larger human rights perspective. Um, sort of also in GDPR, you have this kind of high risk impact assessments, but again, in, in, at the workplace, wouldn't the workplace automatically be high risk because you always have lots of personal data. You want um, analytics that actually go to the individual level. So lots of um, differential privacy or, or, or other ideas are, are actually quite um, problematic in the workplace context. So again, um, hopefully the UNGPs, when they are <clears throat> more clearly defined for the tech industry, can kind of deliver this contextuality um, of, of, of the application of, of certain data-driven business practices and, and sort of move the discourse from child labor issues in the cocoa industry also to these really data fight um, issues that are raised. Um, and again, um, our stance where it would be that um, we, need to, we need to show that these progressive pra business practices actually work. Um, and then again, we had, we had one uh, question in the Q&A box about sort of China and US dominating the discourse. Again, business is global and also companies that are headquartered here in Switzerland, um, they have global policies on human resource management, for example, but they cannot roll out these global policies without taking into account the um, contextuality, of course, with regard to labor law, but also with regard to all other human rights that might be affected if they are implementing data tracking to protect workers against COVID and then combining this with workplace monitoring techniques. So you can probably imagine that the data that might be collected can be very, very um, problematic when it falls into the hands uh, of, of states in, in kind of fragile political context. So that's, that's just something to be in mind. Um, I'm, I'm ending a little bit with a glimpse of hope where I just see from a, at least from a, a language level, I've read that, um, so what Google is actually requesting from the European Commission now with regard to their white paper on AI is uh, more clarification on what due diligence, they're not saying human rights due diligence, but they're saying what due diligence would mean for high risk AI applications. So, and I think there from, 
putting down my civil society hat on, um, that that would mean let's make sure the way that, for example, bodies like the European Commission will refine high risk application of AI can be combined with human rights decisions requirements. And again, it, it was great to, to see that language used in, in the statement by Google. But um, yeah, we need to really work on this and, and make it um, as precise as possible to change the things on the ground. Thank you very much, Isabella. Thanks also for uh, ending your presentation with some hope. I think we all uh, need that. But um, so I, um, I was wondering also based on your, um, on your study, what you just uh, discussed, what would be like maybe some practical recommendation uh, that you may have or found out during your, um, uh, your study for, um, for business, uh, government policy makers. Uh, so where to start with adapting the, the UNGP to this data-driven uh, context that you just uh, described? Yeah, we, so we, we, we really went through kind of all the four or five steps of, of human rights diligence. Um, I mean, there's different um, um, opinions on that. Obviously, if it's four or five steps, um, but in, in essence, um, we, we, we highlighted that it's, it's really important to look at the whole data life cycle. So just really from the development of the, of the practice until, until the uh, deployment. And again, during the deployment, there might be unintended consequences that might occur. Again, there you need mitigatory measures, you need feedback loops, you need uh, corrective measures. You, you actually want to, of, of course, get rid of the human rights, uh, negative human rights impact if you can. Um, some of the measures that we um, propose, if they exist, um, work with workers' councils. Um, for, for data testing and really consult with, with employees, users, but also affected stakeholders groups that might not be, in a legal sense, be bound to the uh, organization. So, so also maybe um, third parties that might be affected by the data that individuals might disclose. Um, very, very important in this space because there's such a big uh, gap when it comes to digital literacy. Really be very clear and transparent in communications about what data is collected and how, and really avoid that there's sort of a function creep that you're collecting data without having disclosed what sort of purpose it's going to be serving, and, and then maybe you perhaps use the data for different purposes than you actually disclosed. Um, yeah, so that would be some of some of the recommendations, but you can find more in the study. It's publicly available on the on the homepage of the German Institute for Human Rights. Yes, thank you. That is actually important to have also this practical uh, practical example and um, um, and recommendation. And uh, um, I think um, we can move now to um, to the discussion now uh, artificial intelligence and that economy can impact. Uh, on a specific type of human rights, that is the uh, non-discrimination. Um, and for this, I hand over to Dr. Florian Osman, who is the policy team lead at the Alan Turing Institute. Yeah, thank you very much, Irina, and uh, thanks for organizing this discussion and, and for the invitation to participate. Um, when it comes to the topic of non-discrimination in the context of AI, uh, there are lots of different issues that one might uh, want to discuss. So I'll just start by saying a few sort of narrowing down the focus uh, of, of, of my comments. Uh, so first, I'm going to assume that we're concerned with algorithmic decision making and questions of discrimination in, in that context. Um, and secondly, I've decided to focus um, sort of exclusively on the risk side. So risks of discrimination that arise in the context of AI. Um, that is to say, I'm not going to be talking about the you know, the benefits or the potential use of, of algorithms to address problems of discrimination. I do think that depending on context, algorithms can make an important contribution to, you know, address uh, the biases that, that uh, are common in human decision making. Um, but I won't sort of uh, discuss that, that side of the topic. Um, now, broadly speaking, there, there are two uh, points that I'd like to uh, make. The first one uh, concerns the role of flawed data in the context of um, algorithmic decision making that may have discriminatory impacts. And the second uh, point concerns the distinction between direct and indirect discrimination. I'll start with the, with the first one. Um, and and the, the, the point there is that I think it's very important to distinguish between cases in which the reason why an algorithm has a discriminatory impact is due to limitations in the data on which it was trained. Um, 
and on the other hand, uh, cases of discrimination that do have an, a sound empirical basis, where there's nothing sort of empirically uh, objectionable with the, going on with the data or what the data is trying to measure, but uh, there nevertheless is a discriminatory impact. So in terms of flawed data, a prominent example, you know, in a business context might be an algorithm that's used to select candidates for job interviews, you know, to review CVs and, and decide whom to pick. And this has been, this is, you know, has been a widely discussed example. Assume the algorithm is trained on past data within a company. Um, you're trying to predict the likelihood that a candidate, uh, you know, is good at their job, performs well. The measure that's used for that is to look at past um, promotion records and look at what types of people within the firm have been promoted to senior ranks. Now assume that the company, you know, company's promotion culture is biased and this discriminates based on gender. So despite equal um, you know, skills and performance, women are uh, less likely to be promoted. So there's going to be a bias in the data um, you know, that shows that men tend to be much more likely to be promoted to senior ranks. Now, in that case, the algorithm would, would learn that pattern and would make the prediction you know, in going through CVs um, that women are uh, less likely on average to, to perform well in their job. Now, the problem in that case is simply that what you're trying to predict, what the algorithm is trying to predict, isn't, what, uh, isn't accurately measured by the data that's available. So the data measures past promotion and that simply is, is a very poor measure of, of job performance. So that's an example of you know, discrimination based on flawed data. And that's a very, you know, it's a very widespread problem, I think, especially since data very rarely is, um, you know, is perfect. So I think in any context of developing a decision-making algorithm, it's a serious challenge. Um, but it's also important to bear in mind that there can be cases where there is nothing wrong with the data in that sense, where there are correlations simply as an empirical effect, there are correlations between whatever one is trying to measure and protected characteristics. Um, and uh, you know, in that case too, then there may be a violation of uh, non-discrimination uh, legislation, but it's not attributable to, to measurement problems. So an example would be um, insurance risk prediction, for example, where, um, you know, a plausible example might be gender-based discrimination in insurance, car, take car insurance, where men tend to have higher rates of accidents and also tend to drive more expensive cars. So there's a plausible empirical relationship between the expected insurance cost or risk and gender. Um, and so even if there's, you know, measurement uh, is, uh, you know, the, the data sort of measures what it's supposed to measure, um, you will then have a, a discriminatory impact. So I think it's very important to separate these two cases because what's needed to address the problem is very different. So in one case, you need to fix the data problem. And in the other case, you need to think about uh, uh, what else you might do to, you know, adjust the algorithm. So that's the first point. Um, the second point concerns the, the distinction between direct and uh, indirect discrimination. So let's set aside the issue of flawed data and, uh, you know, simply focus on cases where there is a sound empirical basis for whatever prediction one is trying to make. Um, I assume most people are familiar with the distinction. So direct discrimination is commonly, commonly defined as a case where one explicitly uses a protected characteristic such as gender as a decision criterion, whereas indirect discrimination refers to cases where gender isn't used as a criterion, but um, the impact of the decision nevertheless affects um, different gender groups differently. So as a result of correlations between, you know, between the results. So again, it may be you're not using gender to um, predict insurance risk, but uh, given that men drive more expensive cars, they'll end up paying higher premiums. Um, so this is again a very important distinction, I think, because what's needed to prevent discrimination is different in, in both cases. So to address direct discrimination, um, to a certain extent, one may rely on the on the solution of simply not using a feature in uh, in the algorithm as an input variable, um, but that doesn't protect against indirect discrimination. Um, indirect discrimination, uh, you know, can can be very difficult to detect, in, especially with complex machine learning algorithms, where there's a wide range of input variables and the uh, model itself is very complex. 
So it may be very difficult from the model itself to sort of see or come up with uh, ideas of potential disparate impacts. It's very important to, in that case, to take seriously, um, you know, different ways of testing the algorithm to ensure that there is no indirect discrimination that, that, that that's unlawful. The other thing though that's worth mentioning in this context is that it's important to decide what metric to focus on um, in measuring whether there is disparate impact or indirect discrimination. And so this is a, an, a point that's been widely discussed, for example, in the criminal justice context, but it applies very broadly. Um, it's the different, different metrics for measuring the performance of an algorithm, including, for example, the rate of false positives or the rate of false negatives um, and a number of others. And depending on the empirical circumstances, it's very difficult um, and in many cases mathematically impossible to ensure equal equality or equal impacts along all of these metrics. So one a designer of an algorithm may be faced with a choice of equalizing false positive rates, for example, um, between men and women, or um, uh, equalizing false negative rates. And so this, I think, is, a, is an interesting uh, you know, policy question, and also a question of legal interpretation, depending on context, to decide um, what, what is the, the criterion and what's the metric that, that matters most and that designers uh, should focus on. Thank you. Um, thank you, Florian, very much. It's uh, uh, very important, th th those two points that you made on the distinction between the discriminatory treatment based on the biased data versus the discriminatory treatment that instead has some uh, statistical basis and, uh, and the distinction also between direct and indirect discrimination and, um, and challenges in, uh, in preventing each. But, um, so you, your comments have focused on, uh, on cases of uh, differential treatments of uh, members of legally protected groups. Um, do you think uh, there are, um, are the, the existing legal protected characteristic um, enough as a legal basis for addressing possible concern of discrimination that arise in the context of artificial intelligence? I think this is this is a quite an important question, and um, you know a question that's probably op a matter of, of open debate, um, and and it'd be interesting also to to hear from the, uh, uh, participants with a legal background on on their their perspective on this. But um, I think a, a general point to take away from from the sort of the implications of, of machine learning in this context is that simply increasingly it's possible to make fine grained. Um, distinctions between social groups, um, regardless of whether these social groups are legally protected or not. Um, and, uh, you know, to provide an example for a non-legally protected case, um, a colleague of mine has done research on credit risk, credit default risk, and the language people use in their credit application, um, including, for example, spelling errors. Um, and one of the findings has been that there is a correlation in people with spelling errors tend to have higher default rates. Um, now, this isn't a protected characteristic, um, you know, your, your, your language skills. Um, it may, of course, often correlate uh, with protected char characteristics. And in that case, it may be partly covered. So, you know, you may have an instance then of indirect discrimination based on the relevant legally protected characteristic. But, um, but that's not necessarily the case, uh, you know, always. And so, I do think in, in this example and in other examples, um, there's another case of a, you know, a car insurance uh, company that experimented with predicting insurance risk based on the number of excla exclamation marks that people used in their Facebook posts. Um, and so there are all kinds of you know, often non-intuitive um, correlations um, that may be considered problematic. Um, uh, and, and there's an open question, I think, at least at a societal level, um, if not necessarily at the legal level, uh, as to what's acceptable and what kind of um, group-based um, distinctions uh, should be yeah should should be considered acceptable. Thank you, uh, thank you, for that. This is um, um, it's very fascinating. I'm sure that we can we can also go back to to some of uh, of your point uh, later in the discussion. But uh, I think we can we can continue on on specific uh, specific rights. 
Um, and we can talk more about the right of freedom of thought in this context, which is, uh, is it's a right that is often uh, overlooked because there is a lot of discussion on, on privacy, on non-discrimination, maybe freedom of expression, but uh, um, we have um, an expert here also on freedom of thought. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, with us today Susie Allegre. Um, she's an international human rights barrister, um, as, as associated at, at the district chambers. Um, and she's also one of the contributors to BBC Radio 4 uh, Forum Internum ser series. And if you're not listening at that, I recommend to you, it's a, it's a great series. Uh, over to you, Susie. Thanks very much, Irene, and thanks for the invitation to this uh, really excellent webinar. And, it, and it's great to hear um, all these different perspectives from different panelists. Um, and what I'm going to talk about, I think, builds on some of the comments that both Michael and Lorna made at the beginning about the need for a more holistic approach uh, to human rights and technology. And so what I want to talk about, I suppose, is more of a what if scenario. Uh, looking at what if we actually used the right to freedom of thought as a prism for regulating technology and a shift away from privacy and data protection. Um, looking at the business model, um, and again, Michael touched on this, the business model that was described by Shoshana Zuboff as the surveillance capitalism uh, business model. When you look at what is revealed in her book, it really demonstrates how the ultimate aim of the direction at, at the moment of big tech is to understand what's going on inside our heads and to influence what's going on inside our heads in order to influence our behaviors. And so while privacy um, and data protection are potential gateway rights to this, I think there's a more profound question uh, that we need to consider when looking at how to regulate tech and what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed um, in technological development. The right to freedom of thought in international human rights law is protected under Article 18 ICCPR, also the right to freedom of opinion under Article 19 um, ICCPR. They're rights which have been very, um, very much ignored uh, over the past 70 odd years. But one thing that is clear, at least in the human rights Committee's general comment on Article 18 ICCPR is that the right to freedom of thought, at least insofar as it covers what's going on inside your head, is absolute. So what that means is that if a practice potentially steps over the boundary from your expressions and, and behaviours to try to get inside your head, then that practice should be absolutely uh, prohibited. And the right to freedom of thought covers all kinds of thoughts. It's not only um, sort of weighty and important thoughts, which are protected, for example, when you look at manifestation of thought, uh, religion and belief. It covers everything. It includes your emotions, uh, fleeting ideas. Um, it's designed to allow us a space inside our heads to practice uh, and, and explore the ideas that we want to then present to the outside world. And it has three main uh, planks. Those are uh, the right to keep our thoughts private and clearly privacy, as I say, as a gateway um, to protecting that aspect of the right. The right not to have our thoughts manipulated and also the right not to be penalized for our thoughts. So while we may be penalized for our behaviors, we should never actually be penalized for thoughts that we may have that we never actually act upon. Once our thoughts are expressed, once we, we say them or, or act on them or write them down, different levels of protection apply. But as long as those thoughts stay inside our head, they are, at least in international human rights law, protected absolutely. So I think there's an interesting question to be had when you look at this surveillance capitalism business model, which, as I say, seems to me to be designed to get inside our heads and, and to understand our inner thoughts. Could regulators uh, and governments draw a protective ring around our inner lives that can never be touched? Is there a way of describing a set of practices or a set of purposes that can never be lawful in terms of technology? And I think one of the areas um, where you find a lot of discussion, for example, around the Cambridge Analytica scandal, 
is whether or not they were actually able to deliver on what they said they were offering. Could they actually manipulate anyone? And you'll find that people are quite resistant to the idea that they themselves might have been manipulated. But I think in terms of regulation, you don't need to look at whether or not they're successful in what they're offering. If you just look at the service they say they are providing, they're providing a service that supposedly gives access to understanding the emotional triggers uh, of individuals in order to then press those emotional buttons and, and to influence their thoughts. In my view, the right to freedom of thought makes that service essentially unlawful. One of the other aspects I think is important to bear in mind about looking at freedom of thought as a prism for regulating technology is that freedom of thought is in itself fundamental to innovation and technological uh, innovation. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, the Soviet Union and the drafting of the EDHR was supportive of the idea of freedom of thought because they said it promoted technological and scientific development. So I also wonder whether shifting the focus from this sort of privacy protective data protection angle into a question of freedom of thought could also promote and, and provoke new directions of innovation in technology that might lead us in a completely different direction while protecting this core um, innocence. I don't want to encroach on the following speaker's time, so I'll, I'll stop there um, this idea about is this the future regulation of technology? Yes, and um, thank you, Susirelli. You could uh, probably talk for, uh, for much longer because there is uh, um, so much here about this, this very um, innovative um, view about using the right of freedom of thought um, as a lens to, to regulate uh, big tech. But just uh, a quick follow up question on your, um, on your uh, presentation. Um, so, uh, do you think that we need a new legal framework uh, for regulating, for, uh, for regulation based on uh, freedom of thought? I think it's quite clear that on a domestic level or on, in any country, um, there's been very little um, development to protect freedom of thought explicitly and very little done in this area. And going back again to the Cambridge Analytica scandal, I think it was clear when you saw regulators, whether it was the um, Information Commissioner's Office or um, electoral regulation, scrabbling to find ways to deal with Cambridge Analytica, there was this sort of big regulatory hole in the middle that just wasn't dealing with this fundamental problem. So I think on a domestic level, um, there is uh, certainly a need. And possibly also on an international level, in terms of international human rights law, while I don't think there's a need to develop new rights, there is maybe a need to develop um, a more detailed uh, protective system around the right to freedom of thought, understanding that um, it is uniquely threatened uh, in the way technology is developing at the moment. Uh, thank you. And actually, this link um, very well to um, to our next speaker. Just uh, before ending over, just a quick reply uh, to one of the of the question with a question from the UNDP just about the recording of this uh, uh, seminar. It's going to be a video um, that is going to be posted on um, the Bicol British Institute of International Comparative Law uh, website. So you can find you will find the video. Uh, recording there um, shortly after the, the end of this webinar. Um, and so um, linking to uh, what Susie just, um, just discussed on the issue of uh, uh, surveillance, um, surveillance uh, capitalism, let's say I, um, I want to now give the, um, the, the, the floor to, to Joe Wesby, uh, who is a researcher on technology and human rights for Amnesty International. Uh, Amnesty International recently published um, a report uh, called Surveillance Giant that uh, focuses on this issue. Um, so over to, to you, Joe. Thanks. Uh, and, and thanks for the invite to, to speak on this really interesting um, webinar. I mean, really picking up on what um, Susie and, and others have said, um, what uh, Amnesty has uh, set out to do with our report and with our with our work on this issue is really to provide a kind of human rights analysis, a human rights lens to this issue around the um, the surveillance based business model of uh, that underpins the, the data data economy as a whole, 
um, you know, and, and is, is, is often dubbed surveillance capitalism, um, this sense that uh, the business model relies on, on profiting from um, harvesting and uh, harvesting people's data on a vast scale and using that, as Susie was saying, in order to really, um, as a tools for persuasion and, and behavioral manipulation. Um, we focused on Google and Facebook as really pioneers of this model. I mean, it's a bigger problem than these two companies. It's a problem that underpins the whole data ecosystem and, and lots of different sectors of the economy. Um, uh, but really, Google and Facebook um, do play a very central role um, in, the, in the data ecosystem and have uh, you know, a real dominance over the, the kind of channels that we rely on um, to engage with the digital world. And that is, um, it's problematic in itself, and I'll come on to that. Um, but I think setting out the kind of main findings of our, of our report um, using the, the human rights framework, I mean, the first one is, is certainly, uh, I mean, I, I completely agree that this is about much more than privacy, but, but certainly privacy, the right to privacy, it's very clear that this level of ubiquitous corporate surveillance that, that Google and Facebook in particular preside over, um, really the, the, the depth and breadth of, um, of tracking our digital lives is really inherently incompatible with, with the right to privacy, it undermines the very essence of the right to privacy. Um, and we set out in the report in, in some detail why that's the case, um, but I think you know, for the purposes of this conversation, I think it is useful to talk about, um, as others have said, the, the holistic impact on human rights here. And it is really that this, the, the, the right to privacy is really a gateway and is so critical here insofar as there's a subsequent knock-on impact on a whole range of other human rights um, linked to the ways that once people's data is aggregated, it can boomerang back on them in a host of kind of unforeseen ways through the use of um, the company's use of algorithmic targeting and, and engagement tools. And we've seen this time and time again, um, you know, impacts on freedom of expression, freedom of thought, as Susie was saying, the right to equality and non-discrimination. Um, and I think what we need to, to do is, is really look at the, um, business model itself as the the underlying problem here um, rather than um, uh, kind of firefighting the the symptoms of this of this of this um, the, this broader problem but to, to, to point to a couple of examples um, I think probably most people will be aware of the the um, impacts of uh, Facebook's ad targeting platform on um, uh, discrimination. Uh, the, the company was forced to restrict targeting for ads because it had been facilitating advertisers to exclude people by race. Um, and there's on another um, uh, angle, I think that there's been repeatedly um, evidence to show how these platforms stoke division and, and radicalization through the way their algorithms boost divisive extreme content. And, and that was shown in a recent piece that came out in the uh, Wall Street Journal, I think last week, and has been repeatedly shown on, on YouTube. Um, and as with most systems of surveillance, there is a kind of disproportionate impact on, on marginalized groups, um, as well as people in, in the global south, uh, in terms of how their rights are impacted. Um, so I think, the final point of our analysis is is really this this um, point on the the power of the platforms and how that's intimately bound with the rights impacts. I mean, I think the scale and dominance of the platforms exacerbates and magnifies these harms. Uh, and from a human rights point of view, the the, the argument that we make is that um, in the modern era, effectively we are dependent on accessing the digital world to enjoy many of our human rights. Um, and that's been very well established in, um, in international um, law. Um, but 
the situation that we're now in is, is this paradoxical situation where in order to enjoy our rights online, we, we are forced to submit to this system that's predicated on, on ubiquitous surveillance and, and human rights threats. Um, and moreover, I think the, the, the dominance of the platforms is a very clear example of the kind of regulatory gap, the governance gaps that Ruggy set out um, uh, insofar as governments have not been able to um, properly regulate these harms that we're seeing time and time again. So I think, you know, just to end, we can talk about regulation in more depth. Um, I mean, I think certainly we do need to look at this holistically. We need regulation that kind of radically resets these, the business model itself. Um, that's not just data protection law, but that's part of it. Um, blunting, micro-targeting, I think, um, and also, I think, ways to tackle the the, the um, dominance of the platforms poten potentially through competition law, I think, is is also important. But uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, thank you, um, uh, thank you, Jed. Yes, uh, I think most of us agree with um, with your finding. But I, I was actually wondering uh, whether um, Facebook and Google have responded to your report uh, at all, and if so, what what is the their position on uh, on these issues? Thanks. Yes. Well, uh, just briefly. I mean, I think it's interesting to compare the two companies. Uh, Facebook did send us quite a detailed letter um, rebutting our findings and, and objecting to the describing their, their business model as surveillance based, um, which I suppose is, is not surprising. Um, uh, I think um, one of the things that is interesting is that they pointed to the, the company's positive role in, in enabling freedom of expression um, throughout the world and they've you know, time and time again, Mark Zuckerberg has, has pushed the kind of freedom of expression line. I think there's two problems with that. One is that um, that's, as I said, kind of exactly part of the problem that we are dependent on these platforms. It's virtually impossible to engage with the digital world without um, being uh, kind of coming under this web of, of surveillance. Um, and the fact that we in order to enjoy our rights online, we, we have to submit to this is, is inherently problematic. Um, and also, I think the, the idea of Facebook as a, as a neutral platform allowing freedom of expression is, is, is nonsense when they clearly it, the company is, is constantly shaping and decide, making decisions around how people see particular um, pieces of information and, 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 and content. Um, and Google, um, I think, is, is uh, and it, it was interesting that Michael pointed to this earlier, I think it's, it's um, quite smart in the way it's trying to pivot itself as, as privacy respecting at the moment, while, while, while very much not um, tackling the fundamentals of, of the business model. Um, and I think that is, is something to really, really keep an eye on. I think at the moment it's, it's the company's... Um, keeping its head down and letting Facebook take a lot of the flack and a lot of the kind of public outrage when, you know, you know it's it, in many ways, it's, um, it's uh, dominance is, is even greater through, for example, like Android, um, uh, you know, most smartphones being dependent on Android. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, um, yeah, it was very, very interesting to hear also about the, the, the specific um, and different responses those two companies said. But uh, now we have our, our final speaker. I think it's, uh, it's important now to have, a, a, again, kind of going back to, to, um, to an overview of the, of the state duty to, to regulate within the business and human rights. Uh, framework. Um, we have uh, Dr. Daniel Aguirre, uh, who is a senior lecturer in law um, at Brockhampton University. Thank you very much. And I'm really pleased to be included in this conversation today as I'm new to research on artificial intelligence technology and its impact on human rights. But 
My background in, re in uh, research on business and the realization of economic, social, and cultural rights uh, makes it very apparent that some of the same old problems are, are here today in this, in this area of research. And that is that we have plenty of international law and standards and guidelines and not enough implementation at the national level. States are very willing to look at the regulation of companies, but not look at the regulation of the overall economic model that has been brought, uh, has been brought up by the previous speakers. And when we're looking at economic, social, and cultural rights in particular, the state duty to protect has really failed in the context of business and human rights. And it's not even being looked at as an issue when it comes to artificial intelligence, technology, uh, automation, et cetera. So they, the changing global economy is not being evaluated in terms of its impact on economic, social, and cultural rights, because that would mean uh, regulating for the redistribution of wealth and resources and uh, states seem uh, reluctant to do so. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the, the state duty to protect and some of the problems for economic, social and cultural rights. And I want to also look at exploring some ideas about how artificial intelligence technology changes in the global economy are impacting economic, social and cultural rights and the, the system itself rather than particular activities of companies. So the state duty to protect is, if you look at national action plans and statements of, of governments, it's all focusing on regulating private sector activities, preventing abuses within this system. None of them acknowledge the artificial intelligence, uh, this economy, global model we're talking about as even a business and human rights issue. Um, instead, we look at regulating private sector activities, individual activities, which is very important, but what we're not doing is ensuring that national laws and policies fulfill the existing obligations on, econo on economic, social, and cultural rights. We're not evaluating this emerging economic model. And what happens then is that we're creating a business and human rights baseline that just reflects the national law in each state, whether that national law is, is, is up to the international standards or not. And, and I think this is, is really key for the state duty to protect. It, it means that uh, states can engage in a business and human rights um, guidelines framework without actually changing their national laws to make sure that they, that, they, uh, that they uphold the obligations that they have signed up to under the Treaty on the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And so in the second part of what I want to talk about is, is how does artificial intelligence, technology, and changes to our global economy affect economic, social, and cultural rights. By far, in, in human rights uh, discourse, we're, we're really focusing on these immediate impacts on civil and political rights that have been outlined so well today. But there are long-term consequences for economic, social, and cultural rights that are going to have far-reaching impacts on society at the national level and international global problems in the future. Now, obviously, this technology can be a benefit for economic, social, and cultural rights, but for now, it is being pursued as a method of making enormous profits. And in order for it to be a benefit, you're going to need some kind of regulation. So we need to look at discrimination, civil and political right, and, its ac and, and at the limitations it may place on access to economic, social, and cultural rights, housing, education, healthcare, culture, etc. And, and I think in the context here that is so important is this issue of income inequality. We have terrible national and international records of rising inequality with both within and between states. And how is the, the changes in the global economy going to affect this? Well, over the last 10 years, we've seen an even greater concentration of wealth. You have these emerging monopolies that seem to control almost in the, uh, most of our international economy. We have the rise of automation taking over jobs, not only just from, not only from working class people, but increase, increasingly into uh, middle class jobs. What will happen to these people? We have the rise of a gig economy based on, uh, on machine learning technologies that leaves young people out of the question in the future. We have I, I also a digital divide at the national level, but also international level. And if you work in international development, this is going to be a, a very important issue coming forward. Um, 
there's also an issue of labor standards that is hardly ever mentioned outside of the immediate impacts of things like the gig economy. There's a whole, uh, a whole different relationship of labor happening in this global model. We are not the customer or the owner in this system. We are the resources and the owner has built this incredible infrastructure to use our lives to make a human, huge profit. What about re remuneration? Is there a scope for people to be paid in this, in this global economy? And, and, and what about the right to work? How are we going to deal with uh, international development based on people on states and people climbing a ladder um, if rungs of that ladder are removed? And finally, I think there's something interesting to look at in uh, this idea of a right to science and culture. Um, it's, it's, it's in both the International Covenant and Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. It's also in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Is it relevant? says that we all have the right to freely participate in cultural life of the community and to enjoy the arts and share in scientific advancement and its benefits. And that everyone has the right to protection of the moral material interests resulting from scientific, literary, artistic production. Is there scope there to help us to, um, to deal with some of these pressing, pressing global issues? So I'm, conscious of the time and I'll leave it there, but I'd just like to say I would, I would love it now if we were all able to continue this discussion uh, at, outside of Bickle's office in real life in beautiful Russell Square and all step out in the sunshine together. But hopefully that will come again in the future soon. Yes, I wish we were we were all in Russell Square actually. But uh, uh, this point on, on tech and economic, social, culture is uh, is really interesting. Just a, a quick follow up question on that. Um, so, what what should states uh, be doing to to protect economic, social, and cultural rights uh, in the face uh, um, of a business model that potentially uh, undermines those rights? Yeah. Um, both the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and all of the general comments by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, as well as the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, ask states to evaluate and reevaluate all their national laws and policies to make sure that they are in line with the obligations and rights held within the treaty. So that, that's got to be the first step. Um, I, my own background working in Myanmar and, and on these issues in Southeast Asia, we saw states very quick to say, well, we're going to set standards on things like modern slavery, on the activities of companies, but without ever looking at their own national laws to see if the laws actually protected human rights or improved those laws. Um, European national action plans make no mention of the impact, not only of artificial intelligence and automation on, bis on human rights, but not any uh, impact of economic, social, and cultural rights at all. They don't even discuss it. So, uh, you know, these issues are, are traditionally sort of seen as political issues or social issues, but, you know, the, the obligation of the state is to protect them in national law and policy, and they're just not doing it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes left, so uh, I would like to ask now all, um, all, all speakers if, uh, if you want to make any, uh, any quick comment or on anybody else's uh, presentation or if you have any, any, any question for the other panelists, uh, otherwise we can uh, um, also have some, some questions from, uh, from the audience. Yes, uh, Florian. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, perhaps just one brief thought on, especially in relation to Daniel's last uh, contribution on economic and social rights. So I think one, one thing to sort of increase, slightly increase the complexity of our discussion, one interesting thing to consider would be the intersection or, or the interaction between different human rights and to add the dimension. So, so far we focused on risks to human rights to also add the potential of different AI-enabled technologies to, to sort of serve the advancement of certain rights. So an example would be, um, again, from the financial services sector, for example, access to credit, where you know, the, the use of non-traditional data sources and machine learning has the potential to increase access to credit. Right? It may 
um, enable a creditworthiness assessment of people who are so-called thin, thin file applicants and for whom banks don't have data um, in, based on traditional financial data in terms of their creditworthiness. So there's a positive potential there. Um, and that could be considered you know, a positive contribution to you know, the relevant economic rights. At the same time, however, that may come at the expense of privacy uh, you know, and, and the protection of privacy. And there's been increasing debate of the risk of ending up in a, in a, with the phenomenon of poverty privacy, uh, privacy poverty, excuse me, um, where sort of there's a, a new you know, social acceptance of the fact that socially disadvantaged members of society just have to live with the fact that they'll need to give up privacy to a greater extent than um, advantaged members in order to achieve certain certain goals right so to for example to get get access to credit or, or uh, yeah achieve other other aims yeah so just add, in terms of adding some complexity to the discussion i just to come in on that i think it's really interesting and the, the you know the intersection is clear between non discrimination non-discrimination and economic social and cultural rights but also what about the idea that uh, that all technology has to be run solely for increased profits like, why are we right now increasing the profits of Zoom rather than having a public uh, system that the, pro that the subscription base, that money goes to the universities fulfilling the right to education, for example? That, that there's just absolutely no thinking about these possibilities for improving public good. And uh, Lorna, you also, um, you also wanted to, to, to make a comment. Yeah, thank you so much for all these presentations. Really fascinating. Um, I just wanted to just come in on the, the privacy point. I think that you know, Michael's point about the shift um, in the way in which companies are, are working and a shift away from data is really critical. But I really also just want to support Joe's point that I think we've still got a long way to go in terms of really ensuring that privacy is protected in the way, not in a way that privacy is used in order to detract from the focus and protection on other human rights, but as in order to ensure that privacy can act as a gatekeeper and to protect other human rights. So I think that there still is a long way to go to make sure that as a baseline, it does protect the range of other human rights. And I think it's a question of how privacy is framed. Um, and I just really wanted to, to pick up on the point that Daniel was talking about national action plans um, and really, you know, within the theme of this conversation to, to say that I still think we're not seeing enough of tech examples in wider business and human rights conversations. And I think um, it's really important when we're talking about mandatory due diligence or we're talking about national action plans that we do really always include tech examples as well as examples from um, you know, uh, the garment sector or um, other sectors. And I think that that will really enhance um, the promotion of human rights in, in those areas. Thank you very much, Lorna. And uh, Susie, you also had, um, had a comment. Yes, yeah, really just to, to reflect and respond on, on Daniel's presentation, which I thought was really um, useful that again looking at the freedom of thought and freedom of opinion perspective while what I was talking about was very much a sort of individual rights in a self um, you know, in the thought processes question it's in all our interests that we have freedom of thought and opinion because when you look at the potential for opinion to be manipulated at the levels of whole swathes of population it doesn't really matter whose opinion and thoughts are being uh, manipulated, the effects could be much more profound on society in general and have wider economic, social and cultural impacts as well as democratic impacts. Um, thank you. Maybe since we have just um, two or three minutes left, uh, Michael, I don't know if you want to to give some some, some comments on, on uh, one of the questions from uh, Isabella Mancini from the audience that is asking about the discussion infrastructure uh, as power versus data. So where do you see the main gaps in, in the current legislation on, on data protection? Yeah, I think it also answers Maria's question as well, which is in mm, the yeah. Um, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I, mean, I, I definitely agree with Lorna, we have a long way to go before we, we deal with privacy. I just think we shouldn't be preoccupied 
um, to the detriment of other things. So that does answer the que ask the question of how do we stay a step ahead if we can try and imagine how to do that. Um, this is where I, f I find, I mentioned it already, I find Julie Cohen's work actually much, much more convincing than Shoshana Zuboff's work. Um, I think Julie Cohen hits the nail on the head with understanding that, that what this is about, it's about enclosing the ability to render populations legible and to intermediate between them. So one thing we have to do is to work at how to unenclose this. And it talks to Daniel's point about, about uh, why aren't we using free open source software? Why aren't we... Um, uh, why are these systems so good at uh, enclosing us in? So there's a few things we can do there. I think one of them is thinking about uh, new rights that initially would be individual. We mustn't stop there. Uh, things like the rights to repair, rights to repurpose, uh, opening up and forcing interoperability, being careful where we do so because also privacy and other things are at risk when we do this. Um, but we start to do this and we start to break down walled gardens and we start to really take aim at infrastructure and, and sole control over infrastructure. But then we have to scale it up because if you stop there, you get to an individualized endpoint and you know that's just kind of geeks trying to fi you know, fix their own, um, their own personal environments. So we have to think of how we scale uh, data rights and rights around technology to, to communities, to NGOs, to civil societies, to be able to give voice to people who find it really hard to, to navigate uh, technical issues and the politics of technology um, and to bring that those voices uh, to, to a bigger stage. Uh, a simple thing we can also do is fund regulators properly. Uh, the, the regulators in the UK, I mean the Information Commissioner's Office is a joke at the moment, an international joke. It has hundreds and hundreds of staff. It is unable to enforce even basic parts of the legislation. Its, um, its budget for legal action is, is minuscule and its enforcement team do not want to take on anything more complex than a data breach. Uh, and it is a complete shambles that we have let ourselves get into this situation. We could imagine that existing law could take us further. So we could make more of human rights law, make more of data protection law if we had regulators who are willing to take creative challenges and to make creative use of the powers they have. That's not what we see right now. So we have to also think about diffusing uh, a platform power and, and put the core focus on on that i think mm -hmm. yes yes very true very true michael um just maybe one very very qu uh, quick last uh, comment I think, um, uh, joe and then lorna you want to to add anything else oh no okay no lord <laughs> only one last comment from joe and uh, very quick and then we'll um, we'll end this uh, this webinar <laughs> Uh, Joe, maybe you are uh, you're muted. Okay. No. Yes. I had a question, but I don't think there's time to to have the discussion. But I mean, I I just would echo what others have have said around the importance of of focusing on on the way that these structures are um, are enhancing power for the powerful and uh, and and be they tech companies, but also governments. And I think we need to look at that holistic um, structural challenge um, and I think that's why the human rights based approach is actually really vital and why we as Amnesty have, have sought to kind of engage with this this issue. Uh, thank you, um, thank you, Joe. And um, um, so from, from uh, Bicol again many thanks to, to all of you, uh, Lorna, Michael, Isabel, Florian, Susie, Joe, and Dania for this brilliant conversation. Um, and many thanks to you for participating and for your questions. Uh, this, the webinar has been recorded. The, the video is available on the uh, uh, Beagle website. And uh, we will continue this conversation in our next webinar in the series on artificial intelligence regulation on 22nd of June. And this will be a conversation led by Lord Clement Jones on uh, artificial intelligence and the future of regulations. Uh, details for registration are going to be available on the BICOL event page. Um, just please, uh, an, an appeal, if you have enjoyed today's webinar, uh, please consider making a donation to support BICOL. Uh, BICOL uh, um, uh, raise, um, uh, relies on uh, um, on a donation to carry out with this with these activities and uh, and our events. Uh, so please consider that. And uh, again, thank you very much. <laughs>